Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you are all well. It's been a few days since I've been alive, and to be honest, I've been exhausted this week because we've had um, kind of like a heat wave, and it's kind of knocked me out completely because I'm not good with the heat. But I didn't want to come to the end of the week without connecting with all of you and doing another live. So I'm here to answer some of the questions that were sent to me earlier today. And hopefully, um, you know, those questions will be beneficial for, for all of you to, to hear. So um, the first question, which I'm being asked quite a lot by um, lots of mothers and fathers who are working and are not able to homeschool their children, um, it, you know, how can they implement Montessori if they're not able to homeschool their children because they're working and also they're not able to put their child in a Montessori school? So first of all, you know, I want to bring you back to um, the foundation of the Montessori method, which is actually the philosophy of how we understand children. So Montessori is more of a philosophy about the rhythm of growth and development of the child and the way that we can support them so that they can go from each stage of childhood from one stage to another successfully so that they can you know unlock their potential and you know fulfill their full potential right Montessori is more of a philosophy for life the academic side is one aspect of Montessori but it's not the main aspect it's not the main part of it if you were to just follow the academic materials for Montessori but you don't follow the philosophy you are not doing Montessori even if you have the materials so this is showing us that actually even if your child doesn't attend a Montessori school even if they go to a regular school or even if you're not homeschooling there's still so much that you can do as a parent or a you know a grandparent or an aunt or whatever it is there's so much that you can do with the children who are in your life which will um, support their development through implementing the Montessori philosophy so it's really important that you develop your understanding of the philosophy we've covered some really basic parts in my live videos but I recommend that you read some of the great books that I've recommended in my earlier IGTV videos read those books and also um, you know try and you know delve deeper into the Montessori philosophy because your child is going to be away from you if you're working or if they're attending school they're going to be away from you for a portion of the day but the rest of the time they're with you and actually we as parents even if we are working full time and we are away from our children, we have the strongest bond and the strongest connection to our children. And the way that we approach them, even if they're not in a Montessori school, the way that we approach them is going to, you know, change who they are in the future. It's going to have such a huge influence on them. So don't feel that because you are not going to be able to homeschool your child or because you you know have to make that decision to put your child into a mainstream school do not feel that Montessori is not relevant to you it's more than relevant to you it's more than relevant to your child and your child is still going to benefit a lot from the method so remember that Montessori is more of a philosophy for how we live and interact and support the natural growth and development of the child rather than being about the materials and the academics and so on that's just one side of it so if you're a working mum you can definitely support your child with the Montessori method um, in so many things that you do now now think about this your child might be in a daycare for most of the day or they might be um, going to a regular school while you're at work and then your child will come home so make sure your home environment is following the Montessori philosophy. Make sure your home environment is prepared for your child. Make sure they can access their sink and the bathroom. They can access their clothes. They can access their toys. Their things are organized. Follow that Montessori philosophy of preparing the environment so that your child can be independent, so that they can, you know, 
choose the things that interest them and so that they can have that experience in the little time that they are at home. And another thing that you can do as a parent whose child is in a normal day take daycare or school is when your child is with you, you can take that opportunity to focus on their individual interests and talents. Now, you know, most likely your child is not going to go to a school uh, even if it's a Montessori school, unfortunately, they're not going to go to a school where the teacher is really going to have the time to give your individual child what they need based on their own own interests, right? It's really, really hard to find schools like that, especially in Malaysia. It's really, really hard. Um, and in a lot of the countries in Southeast Asia, Montessori is very commercialized, so it's not really about the individual child. It's just about, you know, Montessori as a kind of name. So most likely you're, you're not going to find the teacher who's going to follow your child's interests so you as a parent take that opportunity wherever your child is going whether they're going to mainstream montessori daycare sitting with their grandmother whatever it may be you as a parent take that opportunity to always be observing your child and observing the interests and seeing what it is that they need so that they can further their learning and development in fact, if you know a parent does that, just a simple act of observing their child, noticing their interests and preparing the environment for their child, if you do those things, those three things, and your child is in the mainstream, they'll have such uh, you know, they'll have such support for their development that if a parent who puts their child in a Montessori school but doesn't do that, they're not gonna have that same support. So it's so important for you as a parent, don't give up, don't feel like because of your life circumstances, you cannot implement Montessori, you can implement Montessori in any circumstances, anytime. It's just about setting your mind to that um, mindset that you want to learn about the natural development of the child and you want to do what you can to support the natural development of your child according to the Montessori philosophy. Just set that in your mind and whenever you're with your child you implement that and of course you try your best to ensure that you put them in the best environment that will allow them but I know that it's incredibly difficult and there's so many of you especially the ones that are in Malaysia messaging me and saying to me that you cannot find a Montessori school to put your child into and you cannot homeschool because you're working and I've had like parents messaging me from England saying they want to move to Malaysia because they can't find a school in England um, and they want to put their child in you know a really good authentic Montessori school there's so many of you messaging and of course it's you know you're in those circumstances where you can't put your child in that school but you still have to put your child somewhere so don't feel disheartened even if your child is attending mainstream school you can still implement the philosophy with them at home please be rest rest assured of that Montessori is a philosophy of the way of your life and school is not your child's whole life it's just a portion of their day and you can have a bigger impact on your child than the school that they go to to implement the Montessori philosophy. I really, really, really recommend that. And then another question that I've got is that um, there are parents who um, are putting their children in Montessori schools, but they can see that their children are not having their, follow their interests followed. They're not working at their own pace. It's kind of more like um, all about the materials, not necessarily about the philosophy and, you know, what can you do about that? Um, you know, I think that, again, make sure you're doing your part as a parent because that's going to have the, the biggest impact on your child. And then you can always, you know, share with your teachers, you know, what you've observed about your child, what your child's interests are, what kind of things your child is working at, being independent with at home. And you can always ask your teachers whether there's any way that that can be encouraged in school as well you can always you know ask them and and you know explain to them what you read in the Montessori books and how you would like that to continue you know of course you know it's not we're not all going to have that ideal situation where you can put your child in a Montessori school we're not all going to have that so you just have to take the philosophy and apply it as best as you can to your life and to your own situation and don't feel disheartened. Do not feel down 
that you cannot give your child that perfect, perfect um, approach that you want, right? You know, it's the intention that counts and we try the best that we can. And then inshallah, your child will have a good outcome from whatever it is that you can do. So um, I hope that answered that question. And I hope those of you that have been feeling a bit worried, especially coming out of lockdown and knowing that you're now going to send your child back to school, which a lot of families are going to be doing in this next month. Um, I hope that, you know, it, you're, you know, you don't feel that you have to give up the Montessori. Just keep going. No matter what the circumstances are, keep going. And your child is going to show you that they are benefiting from that. Okay, so um, another question that I got is how can I help my child to focus and develop their concentration? So um, one of the key ingredients to developing the child's focus and concentration is that the activity that they're doing is something that interests them. Some people have this idea that in order for an activity to interest the child, we have to put lots of colors and lots of shapes and lots of things so that the child is captured by it, lots of flashing lights or lots of, you know, uh, we think sometimes that we have to um, create these, these overstimulating activities so that the child is interested. In it. And yes, those activities might capture your child's attention for a few moments while they are overwhelmed by the colors or by the lights or the sounds. But actually, it's not something that you do in creating an activity that is going to uh, cause your child to focus with that deep attention and concentration. It's actually that children will naturally be urged from their inner teacher. We've spoken about this in other lives. They're urged by their inner teacher that's directing them to seek from their environment activities. And by activities, I don't mean activities on the shelf. I mean any kind of activity that they want to do whatever it may be seek activities that are going to support their learning and development the child is urged from within so if we want to find out what is what is the area of key interest that's going on right now for your child you have to observe your child you have to give them freedom to move and act on their environment and you have to observe them because anything that is of interest to the child based on the urging that comes from within them anything that they choose that is coming from that urge coming from that push that's guiding them to engage in something any uh, you know, activity that they do is going to have focus and attention in it because that's what the child needs for their learning and development. So if the child shows you an interest in something they have chosen themselves, they will have that concentration and they will have that focus. But if it's things that we are trying to get them to do, that's according to our own plan or our own agenda or our, our own ideas, and it's not based on the observation of the child, they, their concentration span will be short. I have had mothers come to me telling me that their um, you know, two-year-olds, three-year-olds cannot concentrate for more than two minutes, cannot concentrate for more than five minutes, and I have just taken out one Montessori activity that I know is you know something that will interest that child just taking out one activity and put it there and the child has straight away concentrated for more than 10-15 minutes a child who supposedly cannot concentrate suddenly can concentrate but that's because that activity is what interests them not what interests me not what I want them to do not what the mum wants them to do what interests them and because it interests them they will focus and pay attention think about this let's say for example you are sitting in a lecture or a talk okay and you've gone with your spouse and it's about a topic that you have no interest it's completely interesting for your spouse but you have no interest in it whatsoever and you're sitting in this like two hour lecture are you going to be able to focus and have that attention no why because it doesn't interest you so you're going to start daydreaming you're going to start thinking of other things you're going to start doodling you're going to start you know like going on your phone and catching up on things that you need to catch up on there right because it doesn't interest you but if you were to attend a two-hour lecture 
that does interest you, most likely your attention will be captured and you will give full focus and attention because it's something that interests you. So even us as adults, we find it difficult to force ourselves to give attention and time to things that we don't like or we don't find interesting. And it's the same thing for the child. It's the same, it's, this is so easy, it's the same thing for the child. If it's an activity that doesn't interest them at that point of time, they will not have that same focus and attention. So if you want to build their concentration and you want to build their focus, you have to give them activities that are interesting to them based on what you have observed in them that they are showing there and then. And by the way, you might show, you know, your child might have no interest in something one or two weeks. And then after three weeks, they suddenly have an interest in it. These interests come and go. It's not something that we can put a schedule and kind of schedule this child's natural interest. We can't schedule it. It's something that's going to come. It's going to go. It's, it's something that is, you know, urged from within the child. So the key is that you observe so you can follow it. That's the key. And another thing that is really important is to take in mind that the child between the zero, uh, age zero to six is in the period of constructing themselves. And they do their self-construction through engaging in meaningful work, real work, right? So things like washing real dishes rather than just, you know, you know pretend washing at their doll's house you know things like mopping a real floor is going to capture your child's attention rather than just having some toy mop that the child is just going to be you know copying you role playing if they had a real bucket and there was real water in there and they were really able to mop the floor they would have a deeper sense of concentration what tends to happen is that we observe our children role playing what they see the adults in their lives do we observe our children do that and then we give them a toy that they can play that with but actually the child doesn't want to play it they want to do it with the real material they want a real meaningful activity they don't want to cut wooden fruit that have velcro that they chop and then they can put back together they want to cut the real fruit so if you give your child you know the opportunity to engage in real meaningful work you will see that their level of concentration and attention and focus is going to increase considerably so bear that in mind and any time that you see a child who has an issue with concentration or focus you should go back to practical life to physical work and to opportunities for real activities go back to that because those are the activities that are going to develop your child's concentration and focus and then they'll be able to transfer that to other activities that they engage in but the key is to follow the child's interest and you will see huge changes in your child so um, another question that was asked today is um, can we set targets for our children so if we're implementing the Montessori philosophy whether it's at home or whether it's at school can we set targets now if by setting a target you mean that by a particular day or particular month the child has to have been able to count to 100 then that's not really what we do in Montessori. We don't set targets like that, that by the age of five, the child has to read. We don't do that, right? But what we do have is we do have a scope and sequence and the scope and sequence has the kind of steps that the child will take as they work towards a certain target. And those steps will be one at a time, you know, based on how the child individually learns and development develops and based on what support they need and they don't need and so on. So, you know, on a weekly basis, we might have a look at the child's um, learning for the prior week and we might say, okay, last week they were working 
on you know counting objects to 10 and counting the number rods or you know you know just counting objects to 10 and now they they're really confident with counting to 10 so this week my target my target is i want to introduce them to the sandpaper numerals if they're interested right so you can do something like that right but you're not going to put the target as by the end of two weeks they have to know all the sandpaper numerals because it doesn't really work like that it doesn't really work that you can manipulate the child's learning in such way and yes i know when they attend a mainstream school their learning is completely manipulated based on the curriculum that the teacher has to implement but if you're following the child's natural development and you want to unlock their potential you don't want to do that manipulation you want to give the child freedom to develop who they are according to their own natural rhythm of development right so that's why if you put the targets in you are disrupting the actual true learning that's taking place and yes if you push your child and you put those targets maybe they will count you know to 100 before the age of five maybe they'll do that but it doesn't really mean anything in the long-term goal of the child discovering who they are and developing themselves and becoming the best person they can be. It doesn't really mean anything. And, you know, I'm, I have seen parents who have, you know, push their children to read by a certain age and push their children to do certain math activities by a certain age and push them and push them and push them because they saw that was what was beneficial for their child and they've pushed them to do it and yes their child read at five or the child did this or the child did that but later on in life you see the problems because you never gave that child the opportunity to be who they were supposed to be when they were three, four, and five because you were pushing them to do something else. And later on, you see the issues. Later on, you see the problems. Later on, you see how the child disconnects from their true self. And, you know, yes, they might have read at five, but once the children are 15, it doesn't really matter whether they read at five or they read at 10. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the love of learning that's what matters and you can kill the love of learning if you pressurize and force your child to read or you have these targets for your child at a young age and you don't allow them to be themselves in their stage you can kill the love of learning and yes your child will read but they won't have that love for reading yes your child will do mathematics but later on in life they won't have that same love they won't so if you want your if your education for your child is based on the long-term plans of your child discovering who they are and constructing themselves and becoming their true self and unlocking their talents and their potential and their abilities and if you want your child to always be in touch with their inner teacher and always be directed from within then you need to be implementing this philosophy from early on because if you you know if you interfere too much you're going to destroy that natural rhythm and then when your child is a teenager and they don't know what to do or they don't know what to study or they're not really interested in anything or they just you know they can they can pass their exams but they don't have any interest and they just don't know what they want to do you know that's because of the damage that was done earlier on so for this question about setting targets i don't recommend you set targets but i recommend you develop your knowledge so that you understand what, what's going on with your child and you can observe them and recognize the stages that they're in recognize the sensitivities that they're having and provide for them in a suitable way according to the montessori philosophy right but don't disrupt the natural rhythm that's taking place by setting your own agenda or your own targets or you know your own preferences for what your child does by a particular age or stage and so on and by the way for those of you that feel really worried if you let go of your targets and you let go of your you know things that your child has to do by a certain age that they might not do it you know those of you who feel worried about that you know i'm telling you honestly the more you let go the more magic you see the more you let go, the more magic you see. And you're not going to see that magic unless you let go. So if you want to see it, because you're only going to have one chance to raise that child. So if you want to see the magic, you have to let go. Let go and you'll get to see it. But if you can't let go, then, you know, you might never get to see it. And also, um, you know, think about the underlying message 
you are sending to your child when you are um, setting these targets that you have to do this by this age and you have to do that by that time think of the underlying message that underlying message that you are sending them is that you don't trust them you don't trust that they will learn and develop naturally you don't trust that they're capable of doing this according to their natural rhythm you don't trust their inner teacher you don't trust their inner teacher that's why you're trying to be in charge of their inner teacher you know you're trying to be on top of their inner teacher because you don't trust their inner teacher right that's one of the messages that you might be putting onto your child right but actually if we truly trusted that the human being is naturally inclined to learning and that they they you know the human being will go through these stages to reach their full potential and they're guided from within if we truly believe that then we are not going to be interfering and we're not going to feel that we have to do something do something to make sure they learn because we trust that they're going to learn anyway so think about that very underlying message that you're sending to your child when you put these targets and the underlying message is i don't trust fully trust that you're capable of doing this without me putting something in place to make sure you do it think about that because that underlying message although the child is never going to hear it they will sense it and that's going to impact their learning so my advice to you is don't think of targets as in by certain ages they have to do this 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 but have a good knowledge of the montessori philosophy have a good knowledge of the montessori curriculum if you're homeschooling have a good um understanding of the, the 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 kind of stage that your child's in so that you can support and observe them along the way and they will go through those different stages and their different interests and their different abilities they'll go through them in their own unique pattern and just be ready to follow them so um another question that i got today is um when to introduce counting to children so when do we introduce counting to children so first of all you know by nature human beings have are mathematical by nature we are mathematical we see patterns we you know categorize things we sequence things we group things together this is a natural function um, of human beings um, by nature and your child will be doing that from a real really 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 young age okay and you will see that your young child will start lining things up you know um, in, in, in lines or they'll start matching things or they'll start um, putting things in sequence and these are all mathematical skills that are really really important that your child has the practice with before you actually introduce numbers right so in the Montessori uh, math curriculum before we start any formal uh, mathematics activities we always emphasize the importance of the pre numeracy skills such as matching sequencing categorizing um, you know and there's all sorts of activities that we provide for the child like that the child has to have um, good concentration before you introduce them to numbers because if they don't have good concentration, then they won't be able to focus on the numbers when you give them to them. So you need to give them the practical life activities or practical activities that they can do in their house or wherever it may be so that they can develop that concentration so that later on when they come to work with mathematics, they have that concentration when they're working with the numerals and so on. Also, the child needs to develop their senses before you're introducing them to numerals they need to develop their senses because the senses are going to give them that deeper insight and allow them to distinguish for example between the shapes of the numbers for us as adults if we look at a two and a three we can clearly see the difference that's between them but for a young child they have to develop their senses first so that they can distinguish between those slight changes in the numbers so usually in a Montessori classroom, we would really emphasize the practical life, sensorial and cultural lessons first. And then when we see the child has developed their concentration, they've developed their focus, their attention, their muscles are stronger, they've developed the ability to um, you know, complete cycles of activities. And we see that the child has engaged with all of those pre-literacy and numeracy activities such as sequencing and um, matching and pairing and all of that and one-to-one -one correspondence then what i would do 
is wait to see when the child themselves will naturally start counting objects. And this usually will just happen spontaneously. If you're observing closely, you'll see the child will come to a point where they start you know, putting things down and they start counting. That's the best time to begin with the numeracy activities. When you see that the child has all the preparation work out the way and then they started counting themselves. And in the Montessori maths curriculum, we always introduce quantities before symbols. So they would be introduced to the number rods where they're counting and there's no numbers. It's called the number rods because we count them, but there are no numbers on there. It's just a counting activity. So they're working with the quantity of the number, not the numeral. So we would work with counting with those number rods. And if you don't have the number rods at home, you can count anything else that you have, but don't introduce the numeral, the actual symbol for the number until your child is confident with counting from one to 10. So give them plenty of opportunities to count objects, count their cars, count their toys, count their peas on their plate, count the people who are having dinner, count this, count that. Give them plenty of opportunities to practice counting from one to 10 and you know, practice in that one-to-one -one correspondence. And then once you see the child can really, really count you know, objects one-to-one, -one, they can count them carefully, one, two, three, four. And they're not going one, two, three, four, five, that you know without the one-to-one -one question when you can really see the child can count objects then we introduce the numeral so that the numeral has meaning so if the child is able to understand quantity let's say they can understand the quantity five they can count five they can understand the quantity five and then you show them the numeral five straight away they can connect that numeral to that quantity whereas if you go the other way which um, a lot of parents tend to do, which is introduce the numeral first, but your child doesn't have the understanding of quantity, then they can't straight away build that neuron connection. They cannot build that connection. And yes, they might learn the numerals, but they don't know what the numerals truly mean. They're just parrot learning this because we are teaching it to the child. It's not really linked to their life. But if you do it the way that Montessori recommended us to do it, which is to introduce the quantities first, and then the numerals, then every single time you introduce a numeral, it's going to be connected to something in that child's life. It's going to be meaningful and it's going to be easier for them to grasp that. So that's just a, a, a quick, there's so much more to say about that. And um, I love mathematics, so I could go on forever. But that's just a quick answer to um, when to introduce children to counting. So um, I don't have any other questions on here. I'm just going to check. I know there were some other questions sent, but I cannot see them at the moment. I'm going to check if I've had any questions that were sent on here before I hop off. There are some other questions that came about um, speech and language, how to support children who have speech and language. Um, uh, um, difficulties and um, a few other more complex but those things will need an actual live just about that and I, I prefer to prepare myself really well for those ones so that I can give you really concise accurate information so I'm not going to answer those ones here and um, also I just wanted to say that today is my anniversary for being in Malaysia for four years so thank you to all of you in Malaysia for welcoming me and having me here and making me love Malaysia. And you know, every single time I reach the 3rd of July, I start to feel really blessed and um, a little bit overwhelmed because if I think back at my life before Malaysia and now, and I just feel so honored that I'm here. So thank you so much to everybody. And I'm so glad that, you know, Malaysia is really taking off with the concept of Montessori because when I first came here, you know, it was really, really hard to find um, people who were interested in Montessori. I did find Montessorians and I did connect with Montessorians. I did visit Montessori schools, but, you know, to find people who really genuinely are as 
eager and as interested in Montessori as me it was really really difficult in the beginning and I remember saying to my husband you know that that how can I survive if there's nobody that I can have these deep Montessori discussions with and you know we've you know I've probably been on Instagram for two years now and you know four years into being in Malaysia I really really feel excited that we have this buzz going on and I know that it's just still a small portion of parents and children in Malaysia who are, are getting used from these um, Montessori things that we're doing but I think that in in the four years that we've been here we've we've made a huge um, step forward and I'm hoping that this time um, July 21 we will have gone even further and Montessori would have accessed even more children and there'll be even more families who are implementing this at home with their children, whether their children are going to school or whether their children are in daycare, wherever it may be, just implementing this with their children. My dream is to feel that, you know, the, this Montessori method has, you know, it's, gone into the homes and gone into the lives of children and gone into the, the the cultures and traditions of people to begin going back to the natural way of observing children and following their interests and going to that natural organic you know method of you know allowing children to be who they are and follow their natural path of development so hopefully um, this next year from july to july is going to be a you know lots of things happening we have other things that we're launching um in the next few months so hopefully that those things will um make a huge impact but anyway thank you everybody for listening and thank you for joining the live thank you for your questions do know that you can always send me more questions if you have them it's difficult for me when i get like 10 questions in the private messages and then um, in instagram you can't really save things like you can in email or whatsapp so it's quite difficult sometimes for me to track back and find those questions again so i recommend that um if there is a question that I haven't answered. I do apologize. I do have every intention to answer them. Just maybe send them on the actual question um, pop-up that I put on my stories. And then that way I can actually save those questions really, really well and access them another time. So I hope that um, you, know, you, you don't feel upset if I haven't answered them and you can ask me again and I'll try to make my best to answer them. So thank you so much, everybody. Take care.